You're listening to the American Home Contractors Podcast. This episode was originally edited for YouTube and may include moments or references that make better sense with a video component. You can find this episode under the same title on the American Home Contractors YouTube page. Now, on to the show. He is a co-owner of American Home Contractors here in the D.C. metro area. He's an early adopter in every sense of the phrase and a huge proponent of Tesla, their mission and their advancements in technology from roof to road. He may also be the first and only person to have danced on a Tesla solar roof. Dave, this may be one of the most famous Tesla solar roofs out there being featured on the American Contractor YouTube page. I don't know if you know this, but as of right now, your series over there is sitting at just over 66,000 thousand combined views. And I know the theme of 2023 for your house, at least, is build it bigger and better. But I want to go way back to the beginning to start off. So when did you finally decide to pull the trigger and install your Tesla solar roof? Yeah, so I installed the GAF DecoTech system. That was our entryway into solar from a roofing contractor getting involved with building integrated photovoltaic products, right? basically solar products that are integrated into the roofing system itself. So the DecoTech product is, well, it was because it's discontinued now. R. Unfortunately, R. it's a great product still. Um, but it was integrated panels that get flashed into the roofing system just like a skylight would. Oh, cool. Yep. So I had 14 of them installed on my house and flashed around. It looked great. I didn't replace my whole roof. I just replaced that section of roofing. And, you know, I was very happy with it. It had great production. It was on the front of my house, which is facing south, southern exposure. So great production, great return. Coupled that with one power wall. It was amazing. The first time that Tesla solar roof was on my radar was probably about 2018 or so. I heard grumblings about you know, Tesla coming out with a product, a roofing product that was going to revolutionize the industry. So we actually interviewed a person who was working for Tesla at the time. And I asked him what he did. And he said, he installed Tesla solar roof. And I said, really, what is that? And he said, well, it's actually glass tiles. So he showed me some pictures of the product and I thought it was amazing. And at the time it was the second version of the product. So they were actually cutting the glass tiles. Oh, whoa, what? Yeah, <laughs> cutting glass tiles on a roof. It didn't sound right, but he showed me the pictures and yeah, it's actually what they were doing at the time. But the version three, you don't cut the tiles. They're glass, it's tempered glass, so they would you know shatter into a million pieces. The photovoltaic, the active tiles, they won't shatter because there's a backer on it and there's wires running through them. But still, you don't cut those products anymore. The engineers came out with flashings to close off the gaps between the edge of the materials where it touched the, the metal flashings, right. like on the edge of the roof, the rakes, the eaves, the walls, the obstructions, all those edge cases, so to speak, were using metal flashings instead of actually cutting the tiles themselves. When did Powerwall enter into the conversation? Was that from the start that you knew you wanted the batteries or did that come later in the process? Yeah, from the start, I know I wanted the Powerwall battery and it really makes the product what it is. Um, it maximizes it because without a battery, you can't go off grid. So, you know, if the grid goes down, like there's an outage, then if you just have solar on your roof, you stop producing because you have what's called net metering where you pull from the grid and you also provide back to the grid if you're producing more than you're consuming without a battery. So when you add the battery, you can actually store anything that gets produced on top of the consumption, right? If you're producing you know, a certain amount of power and you're only using a little bit of it inside of the house, then that excess power goes into the battery and it stores mm -hmm. for later so that when in the evening, say, the sun goes down, you discharge that power into the house where you need it after the sun went down, and then you begin the process all over again the next day. So without that battery, the grid's out, you're out. So it is really important to have the battery coupled with solar. And I think in 2023, that's going to be the theme more or less is coupling batteries with existing solar systems so you can add more functionality to the product that you originally installed. So I do have a DecoTech system on my shed. I have the Tesla solar roof on my main house. Mm -hmm. And since I have two panels, I broke the solar systems into each panel. Oh, I see. Yeah, right. Right, so my shed is actually powering my one panel and my Tesla solar roof is, paneling, is powering the other panel. And I have two batteries for one panel and three batteries for the other panel. So that's 
kind of how it's structured and set up. It's a little confusing if you look at the, 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 the string diagrams and, you know, it took a lot of electrical engineering and designing and uh, this is very unusual, right? Having two different solar systems powering two different panels and different batteries and gateways and all that. So it's, it's complicated, but it helped me learn the product and I live with it every day. I am part of the Tesla ecosystem. I'm part of the future of electric vehicles, solar production coupled with batteries. So yeah, I live with it every day and it's, it's been great. You know, and it's no secret that you are striving for energy independence, especially up in northern Maryland, where the grid isn't as robust. Uh, you know, I've seen your data on the Tesla app where you know, you're losing power every single day for, for different parts of the day for different lengths of time. Um, but that is slightly concerning with an aging power grid. And it is definitely something that not enough people are focused about or worried about. I don't know if worried is the right term yet, uh, but it's definitely coming. It's on the horizon. Oh, well, they definitely should be aware of it. You know, I think we're right now, we're still, we're still building awareness to solar roof in general, but coupling it with batteries and knowing that you can't be off grid unless you have a battery and how important it is to be energy independent and mm -hmm. s self-sufficient. You know, I think, you know, people aren't aware of, you know, the grid situation out there and the infrastructure and the aging infrastructure and how much money and, you know, all the other things that go into maintaining the grid, how it's going to affect the uh, reliability in the future. I mean, you can see it in other parts of the country, like California, you know, the brownouts, the blackouts, the, um, the fires that are occurring because the infrastructure is just aging and we just haven't been able to maintain and keep up on it to where we need to. So, you know, hopefully that doesn't happen in other parts of the country, but, you know, unfortunately it probably will. And people need to be aware of that and get ahead of it. And that's what we did. Look, you know, we're on you know, a grid that spans through Pennsylvania and we're on the edge of the grid, literally on the edge of the grid right. across our, across the street is BGE. And on this side of the street is Potomac Edison. So we are literally <laughs> at the end of that grid and it doesn't tend to be as reliable as Baltimore gas and electric, but you know, we, that's one of the main reasons that we wanted to go solar and wanted to have batteries because you saw in my app, you saw all the events, the power outage events, whether yeah. it's five minutes, 12 minutes, one day, a few hours, you know, it adds up and it's nice to be able to, you know, have the, the batteries so that if and when the grid goes out, we can continue doing this podcast. We can continue watching TV or being on the computer yeah, or anything like that. Life goes on. <laughs> life goes on. And we look out and we see, you know, when the power does go out, we see the other neighbors, everything just goes black. And unfortunately, they just got to hunker up and, you know, put on a few flashlights to walk around, maybe light the fireplace and read a book or something. I don't know. But, you know, we can continue moving on and doing, you know, for the most part, what we were doing before the power went out. So yeah, it is it, it has to feel great to be the house that has the lights on during a blackout. Right. Oh, it's it's amazing. It's amazing. And look, we, we bought a freezer because of the setup we have. Mm -hmm. We got half a cow last year. So, yeah, we're able to do that because we know if the power goes out, we can at least back up the freezer so that nothing spoils, you know, we're right. not completely out. So it affords you a better lifestyle and affords you some things that you weren't able to do without having the backup capabilities that Powerwall provides. Now you are still connected to the power grid. Uh, that sometimes is unknown when you're talking about solar and you're talking about uh, reliability of the grid. A lot of people are thinking, oh, Dave's house is completely off. You are just self-sufficient, but that's not the case. Uh, how much, like percentage wise, how much of your power is still from the traditional grid? So it's hard to tell currently because we did add some active tiles to the existing roof recently, uh, which we can talk about. We're getting but, there. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> um, but previously, based on the data I have, it was about a 45 percent offset. Now, we are full electric. We have an electric heat pump. And it does get cold in Maryland, so that thing runs nonstop in the winter months, especially when it gets really cold, emergency heat, using a lot of electricity. Uh, and we also do have two electric vehicles, so mm -hmm. both Teslas. And I drive a, a decent amount for work, so... You know, we are using a decent amount of electricity. We also produce a decent amount, but, you know, that's why we're at 45%. Now. We did, some, we did make some changes throughout the course of last year. We got new energy efficient windows. We got energy efficient doors. And uh, next week, actually, we're installing an energy efficient fireplace, an insert unit, um, so that we can have another 
heat source during the winter months. So it'll be interesting to see how things play out in 2023 for us because we added active tiles. So we're going to have more production in 2023 than we did in 2021 and 2022. And we're going to have a more efficient use of electricity in 2023 with those windows that we installed with those doors that we installed and then that energy efficient heat source that secondary heat source for us in the winter months yeah there's a reason why we call this place the solar playland or you know, the the solar world uh, out here in the middle of the woods we're up in northern maryland right on the pa line or close to the pa line um the weather up here is different than pretty much all of the state of maryland you know the the more south you go towards dc and virginia the warmer it gets here on the coast we're not seeing as much snow but up here it is a completely different story yes yeah, so any solar panel product i mean it's glass so it's going to shed the snow pretty quickly and that's a problem with any any solar product to be honest um, a lot of people do complain about it with you know having solar panels and there's no guard or fence or anything at the bottom of the roof to really catch it i mm -hmm. mean it's one of those things where if you keep the roof keep the snow on the roof you're blocking production right, right for when the sun comes back out after the snowstorm is finished but if you don't have something to at least slow down or catch the snow at the bottom of the roof from falling off quickly, then it can obviously do damage. It can, you know, ruin bushes. It can mess up railings. It can be a safety hazard on walkways and over front doors and entryways and stuff like that. So yeah, we didn't really have any snow system for the deco tech and we don't have it on the shed right now. The snow just kind of falls off and collects in the gutter and then just spills over onto the ground. But all in all, it doesn't seem to be that big of an issue, especially where it's located. But yeah, depending on where the panels are located on somebody's house, it could be a concern. And there are some solutions out there so that people can catch the snow so that it doesn't keep falling and, and damaging something below it. The most recent stride for the new, you know, round of solar roofs has been the snow fence. It could save a roof from, like you said, all of that snow, you know, come wintertime slosh sloshing off of that roof and uh, injuring, you know, plants, landscaping, God forbid, family, animals, whatever else down below. The snow fence is an awesome protection uh, that can be added and retrofitted as we saw at your house to a solar roof. Yes, the snow fence is amazing. And uh, we, we should clarify that Tesla makes the brackets for the snow fence. So I the, see. The snow fence itself, you can use a lot of different manufacturers. We used a manufacturer called S5. Okay, okay. Right, so that's the actual snow fence product. And you can buy a snow fence from a lot of different manufacturers out there that do snow retention systems, which is great because it gives you flexibility in the different markets to pick and choose the right product for that particular market that might be easier to get lower cost to ship it out and all that good stuff, more available options possibly to the local local consumers. But um, we chose that product because the price was great. It looks good. And Tesla had to do a lot of designing and engineering to figure out the brackets that needed to be used so that one, it can attach to the actual rafters or trusses of mm -hmm. the roofing system right through the plywood into the the meaty part of the roof right. so to speak the structural components and you know after that that anchor is attached then you need to actually attach the snow fence bracket to it and you need to make sure that through the engineering that it can withstand a certain amount of load onto those those pressure points right 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 so that it can hold you know a certain amount of snow whether you're in the the rocky mountains or up in the appalachians or here you know we, we we tend to get a lot of snow some winters this winter's been kind of unusual we haven't really gotten anything yet but it'll probably lead to a snowy february or march knowing knowing maryland weather and it's so secure that you can actually walk on it get out yeah so like you know once you get the snow fence installed at the bottom of the roof you can actually use it as kind of like a walkboard Whoa. to support yourself as you're walking along the bottom of the roof, which is really cool. I mean, it's 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 beefy. So so the the anchors, right, that Tesla engineered are installed through the plywood into the rafters, into the trusses, right? And you got to use lag bolts to do that, right? Lag screws. Really beefy hardware, and these brackets are thick. So, you know, you need something really thick and juicy getting into the meat of the uh, the wood, right? So that it becomes part of the structure. And then you have to install metal tiles over top of that. Okay. 
So, you know, with the Tesla solar roof system, you can't have any of the wires touching metal because it would right. ground the system at the roof level, which is a, a no-no. If you have active tiles below the, the fence, right? So, right, you, so right. let's say your first row is active tiles, mm -hmm. then you need to install flexible conduit for those wires to run through oh. underneath of those metal tiles so that those, those wires do not touch the tile and right. don't ground the system out. Underneath of any metal tile, you have to install support brackets, at least six of them. So you have to install, you know, the process is first you install the, the anchors, right? The snow fence anchors. Then you install the support brackets. Then you install the flexible conduit. You run the wires through it. And then you install the metal tile on top, screwing it down to the actual support brackets. I see. Okay. Right? So it's a, it's a little bit of a process and it makes things much more complicated from an installation standpoint. But again, it's worth it in a lot of cases, especially in the northern climates and steep roofs that, you know, that present a, a safety hazard right. when the snow comes off. Well, to save my butt, <laughs> because I did not catch that they were drilling into metal tiles mm -hmm. uh, during the installation. The video, I don't think I'm going to have to go back and watch it, but I could barely tell the difference between the glass and the metal tiles. That's... They are textured. They're colored all the same. And that's the goal. Uh, but I was three feet away from the install. And I was looking at it like, how are they drilling through glass? What is going on here? And I just did not have time to ask because the crew was moving so quick. You know, they, they were accurate as all get out, but they were moving. Yeah, that, okay, that blew my mind. Props yeah, to Tesla the for metal making tiles a look like the glass tile. And yeah. the, the inactive tiles look like the active tiles. Right. You know what I mean? So that's why everything blends so well together because you can't tell. Right. You know, unless you really know what you're looking at, you can fly a drone up and you can sometimes see the active tiles because it, certain lighting, they look a little different, different angles. But from the ground, especially, you can't tell. So and even the flashing is um, textured these days. So the flashing kind of blends in better than it did in, in, in previous versions or previous iterations. That's that's unreal. Yeah, it, it is mind blowing, especially when you're up that close. And, you know, if you're not seeing it in the perfect direct light that's going to show those material differences, it really is you know seamless. Speaking of being seamless, obviously, you don't want to sacrifice all of that real estate for metal tiles. You want as many photovoltaic tiles on the roof as possible to collect as much energy as possible. So how close can they be? I know you said you need conduit under there to make sure everything is properly, you know, not grounding itself uh, to short the system. But can it be, you know, just one row away from your snow fence? Yes. Yes. In fact, you can install one row under the snow fence and then a row immediately above it, Whoa. which is great. Yeah. So that way you only lose one row of active tiles. So that is another good point you bring up. So whenever, wherever you install the snow fence, that row cannot be active tiles. Right. So you do lose a certain amount of, you know, production capability, depending on how how many rows and how much snow fence you have installed on your roof. So again, there's pros and cons. Right. Yeah, of course. Um, so, you know, the, the process is involved. It's a little labor intensive to put the snow fence up. You need to remove tiles and replace them with the snow fence and all of the metal fittings. During that process, I know we removed a little more of your roof than I was expecting. You were also adding PV tiles, more active tiles to your roof. So if we can talk numbers here for a second, you were crunching, you know, you were really working your calculator out before we jumped on uh, today. But what was the t active tile count before the new update and what is it now? So when we first installed the roof in 2020, the active tile count was 194 okay. active tiles. They're not huge. They're not like solar panels. No, a lot of people get that confused. So they're roofing tiles, 194 of them. Previously, we added 25% more, Whoa. right? So now we're up to 243 active <laughs> tiles. So 49 <laughs> additional tiles were added when we did the snow fence installation as well. And that's why we tore off a decent amount of the roof in the back and a little bit in the front to accommodate these new active tiles that I wanted to install. And the reason that we weren't, that we didn't install these originally was I didn't fully understand the roof space, how big the product was and how many active tiles we could actually install on the roof. 
right? So we made it a little conservative just to make sure we could fit everything. But then I realized, especially based on the plan set, I was like, wow, we could actually fit a lot more as we were installing my roof originally. I was like, ah, oh, bummer, man. I could, <laughs> I could fit a ton more. Well, one day I may consider adding them. So I went a couple years, looked at the data, looked at the production, the consumption, mm -hmm. and ultimately made the decision to add active tiles. And that can be done for any of the Tesla solar roofs that were installed previously. You can add, you know, additional active tiles to get more production out of it. And just like the batteries as well. So I went from, you know, one battery originally with the Decotech system to what was it? Three batteries. When I added the Tesla solar roof in the Decotech system, I had two and one right? So three batteries total. And then eventually over the course of last year, I added two additional batteries. So five power walls plus more active tiles. So this year is going to be great to actually see the production consumption, uh, charging and discharging stats at the end of the year. I'll actually really be able to see what this has turned into. Yeah. A 25% increase. Seems like you're going to be happy with <laughs> the output, oh, you know, absolutely. come, come day three, six, five of the, uh, of the update here. Yep. And I mean, this product, it, when we say new, it is new. Your home was the, what, the second home that we installed snow fence on? Yep. The second home that we installed it on, we installed one in Pennsylvania and you know, have, a little further north. Has that customer gotten snow? Have we heard anything checked up on a you know, wellness check on the snow fence? Uh, I, you know, that's a good question. I think there, I think he may have been in the snow line that one storm because yeah, you know, right. we just got, we just been getting rain in Maryland this year, but yeah, I think further North there was some snow we have to check in, but yeah, I mean, looking at the snow fence, this, this product, the S five product we used, it's been around for a while. So it's going to perform. Right. Yeah, know? of course. It's going I'm, to, I'm just interested to see the you know, the, the solar consumption, you know, how quickly does that snow shed? Oh, yeah. How, you know, just all of the, the stats behind the, the scenes there, you know, is it, are you, is it a significant detriment to your productivity that day to have a safety element built into the roof? Yeah, I would say probably not. Um, you know, especially if you're talking safety, you can't put a price on it. So yeah, if it's a safety concern, just put the snow fence on there and deal with, you know, the loss of production or, you know, the lower production. It's not that big of a deal in the scheme of things. And we're only talking the winter months when the sun is low in the sky. Production tends to be much lower in the winter anyways. You know, one of the unfortunate things in the winter is, you know, electrical consumption tends to be higher in the yep. winter, you know, heating your home <laughs> up north, you know, you heat your home in the, in the winter and that's using a lot of electricity. So the electrical consumption tends to be higher in the winter. The production tends to be lower. So you're kind of fighting that battle of how do I, you know, reduce my consumption as much as possible? How do I squeeze out as much production as I possibly can? And, you know, what does that lifestyle look like? Because if you do lose power and you have to rely on your solar production and your batteries to store and discharge that energy, then you have to really think about what that looks like from a self-sufficiency standpoint. You know, energy independence is something we all should strive for to some degree. And in the winter months, you might have to adjust your lifestyle if you tend to lose power more and you have to rely on your solar and batteries for most of your lifestyle. While we were doing the recent updates to your roof, uh, I noticed that the underlayment was a different brand. It was not Tesla brand underlayment. When did Tesla switch over to their own underlayment and why? Is there anything different that Tesla offers for their underlayment that is different than, say, the Firestone, which is what they started with? So, yeah, Tesla's made a lot of changes to their product over the years, right? They went from version zero. Now we're at version three. Um, so the product has changed itself, but you know, different components have changed as well. And one of those is the underlayment. So when we were first getting certified, we were using Firestone underlayment and we had to overlap it 18 inches. So it's a 36 inch roll. We had to overlap it. So it's like doubled up to meet the class A fire rating. Mm -hmm. And you know, it, it meets that, that code rating and the permit offices, they allowed for that product to be used. So that was what was what was provided to us starting off. Mm. The product had a lot of limitations, though. Um, you know, for one, it was pretty slippery. 
So any like dew in the morning would create an issue trying to get up on the roof early. So sometimes we'd have to wait until 10 a.m. for us to get up there and walk around safely. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it was it was um, it was pretty challenging. After the underlayment heats up and lays flat, it actually is a good product. You know, it's still being manufactured to my knowledge. It's just that we're not using it with the Tesla solar roof system anymore. They did change to a better underlayment, in my opinion. Again, always trying to optimize and make the product better. The underlayment that they switch to is a product that they they do put their their tesla logo on and it looks beautiful and it's more like a canvas feel to it Mm -hmm. so walking around is a lot easier and it holds up better right with foot traffic and it's just again trying to make that product better so that not only does the homeowner get a better product but the process of installing it is safer and easier for the crew so that we can get it done quicker is it still a 36 inch roll Yes. And yeah. do you still need to overlap it? Actually, it's 18? a little bit. I think it's a little taller than 36 inches. Okay. Yeah. Does it still need the No, it does stone? not need to be doubled up. Oh, okay. So, yeah, it's just a single single underlayment, no, which is great. Like, it's got right. like a four-inch overlap on it, which makes it super easy. Coverage is a lot better, right? Because, you know, with those 36-inch rolls and having to overlap them 18 inches, <laughs> right. you had to, you know, it was a, took a lot of it's rolls. a lot of product. A lot yeah. of underlayment. So, and it really, you know, made it thick and, you know, cutting it with a knife was difficult and presented all sorts of challenges. But this new underlayment is, is fantastic. What is your outlook for the next five years uh, for your home, not for the industry? What are you looking for? What are your goals with your solar consumption? I'm assuming it is to become 100% sustainable on your own power supply here. Uh, but does that include anything else? Where do you see this scaling? Yes. So 100% would definitely be the goal. It's going to be hard to get there. I've run out of roof space. Um, (laughs) You know, a a ground mount. Shed number two. Here we go. Yeah. A garage or some addition, (laughs) you know, could possibly consider. But I think looking at the consumption, you know, with that fireplace as a secondary fuel source or energy source in the winter, I think that's, you know, that's going to be important, especially for the winter months. And I think just really focusing on the consumption trying to reduce it as much as possible, being aware, you know, we've already become aware now that we can track everything through the app. So we can see, you know, how much we're using, you know, how much the dishwasher and the washing machine and, you know, all those heavy appliances, how much they actually use. Once you plug the car in, how much energy you're consuming, you know, so you, it brings awareness. You, you know, we turn off the lights, we try to not be wasteful. So, you know, being ultra aware of, of, the electrical consumption over the course of the year, looking at the data, figuring out areas that we could possibly cut back on, right? To hopefully achieve more offset of the production versus the consumption. You know, I, I would like to to see in the next five years, like you said, I'd like to see if Tesla does get into the HVAC because they've already, you know, done a lot with the vehicles and, you know, the HVAC and, and those electric vehicles to be very efficient. So they could apply that learning and, you know, that technology into the home and kind of, you know, help people consume less with more efficient HVAC units. And yeah, that's one thing that I, I definitely am, am hopeful for. So we'll see if that comes to fruition. There's also smart panels, electric panels that are smart. So you can actually go down to the breaker level and see individual breakers and the consumption and kind of, you know, turn things off in the event of a power outage. And, you know, Span.io has an yes. amazing product. I looked into that. So again, I'm kind of just waiting to see, you know, how this year plays out with the stuff that we've changed and then keeping my eye on Tesla and seeing what they're going to get involved with if they do go into the panels, right? I mean, these things make sense to me, but obviously it's got to make sense for Tesla and it could be just a matter of timing for them. Yeah. Well, I'm excited to see what the future holds for Northern Maryland's solar playground here. Dave, thanks again for joining us. I look forward to the next one. Yes. Thank you. You've been listening to the American Home Contractors podcast. You can find us across the web on YouTube, X, TikTok, and Instagram at AHCDMV. If you have an upcoming job or have any further questions about this or another product or service we offer, please contact us at AmericanHomeContractors.com. Thanks. We'll see you in the next one.